Hello, everybody. Welcome to PNP Live. My name is Beth Wong, and I'm an events coordinator at Politics and Prose. Uh, we thank you so much for uh, joining us today, um, and happy Father's Day to everybody celebrating. At any time during the event today, you can click on the link in the chat to purchase tonight's book on PNP's website. Um, uh, this evening, you can also ask our author, Garrett Peck, a question by clicking on that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, on to the main event, historian Garrett Peck is a great friend of politics and prose, um, and his new book, A Decade of Disruption, chronicles the turbulent first decade of the new millennium in the United States. We are so happy to have you here with us, Garrett. Um, welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Beth, and uh, welcome everyone, and thank you for your support of Politics and Prose. And by the way, happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. So I'm really honored to be here again uh, at Politics and Prose. Obviously, a little bit of different setting. I think we're all kind of getting used to, to Zoom, so over these last three and a half months or so, it's kind of our new normal now here. Um, yeah, you're looking at right here, this is my home office and guest bedroom. Uh, this is where I've written all eight of my books, right from this desk that I'm presenting you from here. Uh, the new book is right here, so very excited. It came out on June 2nd, A Decade of Disruption, America and the New Millennium, 2000 to 2010, sorry, to 2010. And uh, it's, a, it's a history of a very controversial, controversial decade that we all live through. We're obviously living through a very disruptive time right now. Uh, we've gotten through our first quarter of a global pandemic. I think every single person on this planet alive right now has, has had their lives disrupted because of this. But we've also learned how to be resilient, how to rise up around this, how to adapt and how to pivot. And we're all doing that literally right now, for example, on this on the Zoom call. So, uh, you know, you've gotten through the worst of, of the first part of it and, uh, you know, we've, we've all had to adapt. So give yourself a little bit of a pat on the back for, for being able to survive this year. The book itself is, uh, like I said, it's, it's a history of that very controversial first decade of the 20th century, really bookended by the dot-com meltdown on one side and then the Great Recession on the other and everything in between. And that includes the, the 2000 election, so the, which included Bush v. v Gore, which kind of set the stage for the highly, highly partisanship of the, of the decade. We had this enormously and definitive event that happened on September 11th, 2001, which is almost 19 years ago, which is crazy. And uh, a whole lot of other disruptive events in between, certainly the Iraq war, Hurricane Katrina, global warming, um, an aging population, the, the fear that our, our demographics were, were becoming ever more, this is the, the fear from, especially from working class whites, that our population is becoming ever more brown and that will then change the status of white people in our country. So all these things have kind of come to fore here during this decade. We witnessed the housing bubble and without the housing bubble, we would not have had the great recession. So those two things go hand in hand, just like that. And I, and I cover all these different things here within the book. Um, the book has 17 chapters and uh, I, it, it does unfold relatively chronologically. So you can certainly read it from start to finish, just like that. I also though encourage you to, to read around it as you wish. So each chapter is a standalone theme. Each one tells its own story. And so that might be something that you might wanna like, you know think about. Uh, for example, I've got a chapter about called The New Retirement, and that deals with our, our aging population. Uh, we have a great gift, which is compared to a century ago, we we're all living three decades longer than people did just a century ago. That, that's pretty, pretty incredible. Um, number of factors go into that partly. Uh, men especially aren't working in horrible conditions anymore where they might have industrial accidents. Also, modern medicine is keeping people alive for so much longer. With that said, of course, uh, what does retirement look like when you have you know, two to three decades? Uh, what do you do with all the time? And of course, the, the big scary monster of, of retirement is what happens if you run out of money before you run out of life? So that's some of the things I address in that chapter, as, as well as so many of us have, have created new, uh, new chapters in our lives you know, by moving on to our next purpose, our next phase of our life and, and so on. So that might be something you want to start off with. Um, if you are a millennial, <laughs> uh, I have a really fun chapter I wrote looking at how disruptive the internet is. Uh, that chapter is called, <laughs> I, I love irony, so I, I wrote the book with a great deal of sense of humor in it, but that chapter is called The National Pastime. And no, that does not refer to baseball, it refers to surfing the internet. So <laughs> yeah, that's, that is our new national pastime de facto. So um, 
look, looking at just how disruptive the internet has been, you know, we, we got this incredible tool back actually in the late 1960s when the, the uh, when DARPA, a, a Pentagon agency, created the internet literally to survive a nuclear war. Uh, and, you know, right, right about 1995 or so, we all got our first email addresses, but that was a quarter century ago. Kind of amazing. So email is not a new thing. <laughs> But uh, looking you know, at the, all the new dot coms, once we got you know, www, the World Wide Web, once that came about, that enabled all these new business plans. And many of them, of course, proved to be enormously disruptive. I mean, you think about like Amazon, which of course came out with Prime, and they've been really the big leader in e-commerce. And that has forced everyone else to adapt to them. So by you look at all the different businesses, and especially look, looking right now here in this pandemic, how many of our local retailers have really been forced to go online and, and to develop websites and, and whatnot? Um, I mean, like all the local bookstores, uh, Politics and Prose, One More Page Books and so on, everyone now is doing curbside delivery and also shipping. It's just, we've all had to pivot. Um, same thing, by the way, for uh, clothing stores, breweries, restaurants, et cetera. You know, when faced with change, you have to adapt to it. And the internet has largely forced everyone to, to adapt to new business models. So I discussed that quite a bit uh, in, in the book. And uh, yeah, also looked at millennial habits and, and so on. So uh, for example, texting, which has kind of replaced phone calls now since uh, <laughs> the millennials were the first ones who adopted it and then everyone else adopted it afterwards. So yay, millennials. So, <laughs> so yeah, those are just some of the disruptive events that, that we lived here during, during this time here. Um, I, I did go into detail here in each one of the chapters, like 9-11, I think that was probably the most traumatic moment of of the decade. And I, I largely left myself out of the narrative other than in the, the book's introduction. In that section, I, I kind of covered my own personal experiences of some of the things that really stood out for me. I live in Arlington, about three miles away from the Pentagon. So I remember hearing the airplane explosion and then hearing CNN talk about a, a plane just hit the just hit the building. And I looked out the window and saw the huge you know, dust cl a black cloud going up. And uh, yeah, it was really an amazing moment. I called my parents right there and you know, it was 8.30 in the morning and they were, they were in California and I woke them up and yeah, it's just, it's kind of an amazing day. Then um, it's one of those few moments really in national history, in our, na our nation's history, where we've had for a brief moment, national unity. It's very, very rare that we ever do that. We, we have you know, fairly uh, tribal culture in our country. And that was one of the key points I wanted to bring up from the book. How did we get to the point where we are today where, it feels not just like Republican versus Democrat, but rather tribe versus tribe in, in our country. And this is not very healthy for us. You know, it's very much an us versus them kind of environment. And so I wanted to trace how did we get to that point through the events of the first decade of the 20th century. And obviously a, a crucial point from this was the Great Recession. And I'll talk about that here uh, a bit more in a few minutes, because that's, that's really an, an incredible moment in American history. Um, one of the things I want to kind of tie in together with our current moment right, right now, we are going through an incredible moment of social change in our country as we reckon, and I think this is part of the cathartic moment that's coming about because of the pandemic. You know, we, Black Lives Matter has existed since 2013, and yet since the, the, the killing of George Floyd on Memorial Day, we've had these incredible protests all around the country, and it really does feel different. And I think there's a number of factors that have all gone into that. Um, the, the pandemic is part of it, Donald Trump is part of it, the, the fact that so many people of color are essential workers, and uh, the fact that so many uh, persons of color are also so many of the victims of the coronavirus. All these things like a giant Venn diagram have all led to this moment here. So I, I feel like this time really is different, but ultimately we do have to get beyond protest. Protest is important, certainly, but we do have to get to the point where we get to legislation and, and actual change. And a key portion of that, I would remind everyone, we have an election coming up in four and a half months. So please, if you're not registered, please do vote. It's critically important here for our country. That ultimately is how you affect change in this country, by electing people who are accountable to your values, okay? So if you're a young person, you're voting for the first time, please do go register. It's, it's super, super important. Please don't be cynical about it, thinking that you can't change. Things do change, okay? But thanks to you voting. The thing I wanted to point out about our current moment and kind of tying it into what to a key event that happened in 2003, which was the Iraq war, which I think everyone agrees on the left and the right, this was a huge mistake. So we, we followed a false trail of evidence and with messianic zeal, we decided we were going to go overthrow this Middle Eastern dictator. 
And uh, we, we did so in about three weeks, which was pretty incredible. We had the Blitz on Baghdad, and then our soldiers got to Firdos Square. There was a statue of Saddam Hussein, and they toppled it. And it's like, yay, we won. And remember that famous banner on the Abraham Lincoln, mission accomplished. Yeah, really? I mean, just because you topple a statue doesn't mean you actually toppled <laughs> the oppression that was there in place. And that's a direct correlation to our own time right now. So I'm all in favor of, of removing symbols of oppression, especially symbols of slavery and white supremacy and whatnot. But please don't think for one second, just because you knocked over the statue of Albert Pike a couple days ago in Judiciary Square, a symbol of oppression does not actually remove the actual oppression, okay? So we have a lot of work in our society ahead of us. This is gonna take years. I mean, slavery has been with us and the oppression against African-Americans has been with us for 401 years, okay? This thing is not gonna get solved overnight or just because we knock over a statue, okay? This is a lot of work we have had, uh, ahead of us in our society. So roll up our sleeves and yeah, let's get to it. All right, um, the longest chapter in the book is the chapter called uh, Gay in America. And this deals, and it's probably the one chapter that really goes beyond the year 2010. And because we all know the outcome from it. So <laughs> I, I really track um, the election defeat in 2004 when gay marriage was used against the gay community. And uh, this is what drove the evangelicals to the polls because 11 different states put, uh, put ballot measures on, on uh, up, up for election that year. And that helped of course drive evangelicals to the polls that year. And then, of course, 11 years later, we get the Obergefell decision in June of 2015, so five years ago this month. And that was the Supreme Court decision that legalized gay marriage around the country. And so it's an incredibly, in geologic terms, it's an incredibly short period of time, 11 years. And American society, it's, it's astonishing how fast society moved on this question. Um, largely, people kind of met it with a shrug, just like, oh, okay, you know. Um, society really took to the idea of gay marriage, so it, it's, it's kind of amazing. And by the way, back then, we were calling for those of us in the LGBTQ community, we were calling it the gay community back then. We still are, but I think we're in the middle of making a transition over towards the queer community. You might have noticed there's all these letters have gotten added on the last couple of years, and it's becoming a mouthful that no one can remember all the different letters. And, you know, don't feel bad if you can't. I, I can't remember all of them. So, uh, so I, I think we'll probably settle upon the queer community over, over time. It's, it's kind of a democratic process. Uh, the weird queer does have some baggage. But uh, if I have a crystal ball, I'd say this is probably the term that's going to win out here over time. Again, that's the longest chapter in the book, and that's even that is under 30 pages, so you can read it in, in an hour or less. All right. So um, let's talk as well here about, uh, about Hurricane Katrina, which was a hugely disruptive event in 2005, in August of 2005, and that was 15 years ago. Can you believe that? So this was a huge event. And one of those things like 9-11 where the country was glued to our television sets. In this case, it really woke us all up to the fact there was a huge amount of urban poverty in our country and overwhelmingly it was African-Americans. About 100,000 people, when New Orleans drowned, when the levees broke, about 100,000 Af poor African-Americans were left in the city. Good people, but they could not afford, car afford cars. They couldn't evacuate. And so we saw from all the helicopter footage and whatnot, remember that, I mean, all the people stuck on top of the roofs or walking in the chest deep water, trying to get to the convention center and to the, uh, to the Superdome. And then, the, the, then the, the, the bumbling federal response to it that really embarrassed the federal government. Um, so it was a hugely you know, black eye moment for the Bush administration. And you know, we had to ask ourselves, okay, here we are 15 years later, we've had a black president, are things demonstratively better for African-Americans in our country? if we used Hurricane Katrina as a benchmark? I think clearly the answer is no. I mean, things didn't improve just because, well, there was no real great emphasis towards fixing the problems around urban poverty in our country. So it's, it's really interesting the debate we're going on right now, uh, like with defund, defund the police, which I think is kind of a poor choice of words. But uh, you know, certainly these are ideas that are being bantered around, around what positive things of changes that we can make to improve the lives of our fellow citizens in the country. So again, it's gonna be a big debate and we'll you know, chime in people because we, you know, we gotta figure out how we're gonna resolve these issues. You know, why, why are African-Americans in almost every category, they live shorter periods of lives than, than, than white people do. Uh, if you get a college degree and you're black, you, you make 20% less money than white people do and so on. You see this across the board, every benchmark. African-Americans uh, have the whole system here 
really set up against them here. And uh, I think a lot of people are kind of woken up to it, to that fact here now. So, all right. Um, other things I want to talk about here. Um, the housing bubble and, of course, the Great Recession. You cannot have the Great Recession without the housing bubble. And this is kind of this incredible thing. Um, this was a private sector bubble that grew. All the banks figured out this new way to go out there and make money. This is what bankers do. They, they need to find new ways to make profits and whatnot. And they came up across subprime. And uh, this, is, um, this is something that had been used actually for decades before, but as a little niche product. But uh, in the years leading up, so really starting about 2003 or so through 2006, you had all the banks figured out how to loan out and then it's actually about 20% 20, 20 of all mortgages were issued on subprime. And then all the bankers figured out how to bundle these together into bond obligations called collateralized debt obligations. And then they got all the, uh, uh, the ratings agencies to give these, uh, these, these bonds a AAA rating as if they were you know, like municipal bonds or something, when in fact these were junk bonds. So these assets were actually incredibly toxic. And in the summer of 2007, which is right about the time I started writing this book, this is when the housing bubble starts to burst because this is when the first adjustable rate mortgages all start resetting and people start grabbing, I should have brought a pair of keys, but this is when people grab their keys and hand them off to the banker and say, I can't make these payments now. Here's my house, you can have it. So, and this is when the housing bubble starts to collapse right at that point. By the way, I should have mentioned this a little bit earlier, but um, 2007 is the moment when I started writing, writing this book. Uh, I had read, if you remember from, I get a little teary-eyed over this, but um, the Washington Post used to have on Sundays the, uh, the book world section, which is this wonderful curated section of about 30 books or so that were the most culturally relevant, re relevant book, books every single week. And then Jonathan Yardley, who was one of the main book reviewers in there, did this great series where he went back and looked at books that have stood the test of time. And in 2007, he reviewed this book right here. So it's, it's, it's a little glossy, but it says, it's by Frederick Lewis Allen, and it's called Only Yesterday, uh, an informal history of the 1920s. And so I, I picked up a copy of it. He gave it a glowing review, said it really has stood the test of time. And... Um, that's when I got a copy of it. And my, my copy here is so heavily marked up here over time. And that's really where the genesis of, of my book came from. It was like, you know what, I could write a history of the decade we were currently going through. So at that moment, I just started taking notes. Every day I'd read the newspaper and just write down the key events of the day. And you know, who knew we were right in the middle of a, of a housing crisis, a housing meltdown, and that you know, within a year, we'd be seeing the, uh, the Lehman Brothers collapse. And I was taking notes all throughout that time. I think probably the most stunning part of the book for me, I mean, other than the 9-11 chapter, the other really stunning chapter is, and, and, and rather both chapters are rather traumatic, and that's the chapter called The Great Recession. And I, I go back and reread that book that, that fall of 2008, when, if you remember, on September 29th, when the House of Representatives voted down the economic rescue package known as TARP, the Troubled Asset, Asset Relief Program. And right then the stock market just nosedived. It went straight down. And I was actually on a telephone call at that moment. I was in Provincetown interviewing Jim Cook, the CEO of the Boston Beer Company for my very first book, I was, I was interviewing him. And over the phone, he suddenly calls out, oh my gosh, the House just rejected the, the rescue package. The stock market is tanking. And <laughs> So that's, this is one of my most uh, indelible memories of, of that decade, you know, being on the phone with Jim Cook right at that, at that moment. And then writing all about that and then seeing how the Federal Reserve and Hank Paulson from the Treasury and then uh, Tim Geithner from the Federal Reserve, how they just kept putting together these different packages. They were basically throwing spaghetti at the wall, trying to rescue the economy from, uh, from Armageddon, from economic Armageddon. And remarkably, it did work. Now, it also, of course, staged, it created a huge backlash against all this because there were a, a great deal of anti-government conservatives who were very much like, you, you bailed out these banks. They created this problem. They did create this problem. And now we have to go rescue them. Um, ben Bernanke, who was the, the, the chair of the Federal Reserve, was a, a keen student of the Great Depression. And he recognized that the Great Depression was, uh, to a great extent, a banking crisis. And because so many banks had failed during this time, we could not allow the banks to fail again. You allow the banks to fail, 
the economy is just going to collapse. The credit is what our economy is based on. So he recognized that. So I, I, I don't fault them for this, for the for rescuing the, the banks. I know it was hugely controversial at the time. It's still controversial to this day. But the fact is, it worked. Uh, unemployment topped out at 10.2% uh, in uh, 2009. And it could have been 25%. We really could have gone over the cliff economically, but we didn't. So, and, you know, so you're just kind of charting this six month process of watching our economy be in free fall all the way till magically March 9th, 2009. At that point, no one knows it, of course, at the time, but that's right when we hit bottom and the 11 year bull run starts up again. That went all the way till March of this year. <laughs> so, and already the stock market has largely made back the, the, the losses from the, from the pandemic. So that's, to me, that's really an incredible chapter in the book. Um, and I just wrote out, here's what happened each day and here's what the stock market responded to. And just reading it, just laying out the facts is, is, is pretty incredible overall, so. Um, but out of the Great Recession, of course, comes out, again, a great backlash we see out of this. One of the key things we need to remember, and this has been going on for decades in American society, and that was deindustrialization. Remember, in our economy, steel really died in the 1970s. We, we still make a lot of steel in our country, but it's highly, highly automated. Um, in case you're wondering, coal is doomed. I mean, there's no rescuing coal anymore here. It's in a free market economy. It can't compete against renewables and natural gas anymore. So, and if anything, the pandemic recession, and we are in a deep recession right now, is really putting the nails in the coffin for coal. So it's, it's, it's a number of companies have gone out of business over, over this because we're using less power right now. Um, one of the things though, over time, of course, in the decades leading up to the Great Recession was uh, automation, not China, not Mexico, but rather automation was replacing many of the low skill, high paid working class jobs. And then of course we get to the Great Recession, um, so many jobs get shaken out. It's like someone grabs a great shaker and out come all the high, high pay, low, low, weight, low skill working class jobs. Um, and there are repercussions to this. And that's a, a key reason, I think, why we end up with this giant working class revolt in 2016. So this is the non-college non educated white people go on revolt for feeling they, that they've been betrayed here by the economy, by the elites. Um, there's also, of course, racial factors that go into this as well. And this is in part what leads up to the 2016 election here. We'll talk about that more here uh, in, in a few minutes. Um, we did see, and I should mention here as well, 2008, so the year of the Great Recession, there's a really crucial report that comes out from the Commerce Department, which uh, looks demographically out all the way to 2042 and says, by 2042, uh, people of European descent are simply going to be the largest minority in the country. So I've got a chapter in the book called A Nation of Minorities. And of course, right then you can cue the, the the right wing white freak out over, over, over status essentially. And you know, sociologists have called this in more recent years, racial anxiety. It's, it's the, the anxiety over status. The fact, you know, white people have always been in charge of our country since the very, very beginning, but gosh, in a couple of decades, you know, we'll be 45% of the society and, and, and so on. And, you know, I think honestly, I mean, I'm not personally worried about it. I think white people will be just fine, you know, but, if you're a working class person, status means an awful lot to you. And that is part of the fallout, I think, you know, from this big report, from the Great Recession. And of course, what else happens in 2008? It's an election year. Who gets elected? The country's first African American, Barack Obama. So, and you saw once, once Obama came into office, I mean, within, within two weeks of him being sworn in, the Tea Party is born. And this is a big protest movement of people they don't particularly have any great ideology other than to stop Obama from accomplishing anything. That's their ideology. And they are remarkably effective. Um, so uh, looking at a couple of different protest movements, um, whatever you feel about the Tea Party, they were remarkably effective. They, they did in fact elect people to Congress and made the GOP very ungovernable. Um, and then con contrasting that to that kind of their counterpoint or counterweight was the Occupy Wall Street movement on the left, also a populist movement. Um, ultimately, Occupy Wall Street really went nowhere. Another protest movement that just kind of fizzled out. And that's my real kind of warning about, about protest movements. They have fairly short half-lives. They don't, they don't go on forever. 
you do have to be able to capitalize upon getting legislation passed and so on. So um, I'm absolutely supportive of all, of all the rallies right now and the protests going on about Black Lives Matter, but do you realize they cannot go on forever? At some point, they do have to be able to transition that into legislative change. And, and fortunately, we, again, we do have an election coming up here, so it's, it's a proper moment for that. But getting back to Occupy, uh, to Occupy Wall Street, you know, sure, they occupied Zuccotti Park in Manhattan. And here in DC, they occupied uh, McPherson Square. And over time, if, from those of you who remember this time, everyone just sort of tuned them out after a while. Like they, sure, they were occupying uh, McPherson Square, but they didn't really have any major agenda. You know, they had a whole bunch of different ideological points they wanted to bring up, but you know, okay, what was the legislation that they brought out? What were the, their key talking points? The, you know, it just kind of, it was so diffuse and ultimately just petered out over, over time. And, and gradually the Park Service came in and shrank their footprint. And I think that ultimately did them a big favor. You know, this is months after they, were, they got established there and basically told them, okay, it's time for you to go, you know, and forced them to basically shut down that little bit. And, and that was probably, the, the, that did them a favor. So yeah, those are two big protest movements that one did prove remarkably successful, the other one, not so much. So those are some of the lessons learned. And yeah, this is the key reason why we study history. Throughout the book, I did, in fact, I did, in fact, subtly weave Donald Trump throughout the narrative because uh, we forget a lot of these things here. But do you remember he ran for the presidency? And you remember, you might remember that in 2012. Yes, he actually ran for the presidency in 2000. Yeah, he ran against George W. Bush. He was on the Reform Party ticket, and so I quoted a few things that he said that. Uh, if you read when you read these, <laughs> you'd be like, "Wait a second, these are the things that people are saying about you now." <laughs> So I talked about the Access Hollywood tape, which we didn't, that was in 2005. And we didn't learn about that until, uh, until uh, 2016. I talked about how he and his siblings, after, the, his, after their father, Fred Trump, died in, in 1999, how they basically raided uh, the, before he died, they basically uh, uh, pulled over most of Fred Trump's assets into their own bank accounts so they could avoid paying about a half a billion dollars in estate taxes. So pretty amazing. And of course, yeah, Trump also voted for, or he, sorry, he ran for the presidency in 2012 and there was also the 12 bankruptcies and so on. So I cover all that. So kind of setting the stage of how we got to where we are today, where we got all this populism on both on the left and the right really running amok here over time. So again, we set the stage here for, for the white working class to have this huge rebellion in, in part because of the Great Recession and the fact that so many people are angry um, over the fact that the economic goalposts have been shifted on the working class, and that's true. But of course, they've also been shifted on people, persons of color. You know, what once was great twenty-five or thirty dollar an hour jobs that you could take right out of graduating high school. Well, now you get to get a fifteen dollar an hour job working in an Amazon warehouse. We've made the shift out of industrialization over to services, and services don't pay as well as the great working class jobs did beforehand. But I mean, the ship has sailed. They're not coming back. You know, this is, we are a services driven economy going forward. We do have working class jobs, certainly, and high paying working class jobs, but they are high skilled jobs. And for that, you need to become like a plumber or have a computer skills to be able to work in the, in the factories today where things are highly, highly automated. And hence, you know, we do, I think, have to look at our educational system as well. But yeah, I mean, the key, the key things here for the white working class, uh, the economic goalposts being shifted the fear of them becoming culturally irrelevant, the fear that, you know, the, the elites are looking down upon them and challenging them and whatnot. And that's, that's part of why they, they went after, they supported Donald Trump. And then of course, the racial anxiety. I'm not saying that all working class white people are, ra are racist. That's, that's certainly not the case, but something that's more subtle, which is racial anxiety, the fear of this losing status. So in other words, it's, it's again, <laughs> it, it's, it's the white people fearing that that society is moving beyond them somehow and again we'll be fine you know but it's it's it, it's kind of this little panic moment among working class whites where status is really really a big deal they, they feel that they've lost their stat or are losing their status in american society so part of that i'm very very deeply uh, empathetic towards the racial part you know sorry not so much it's demographically we are in fact becoming more brown and that's just a that's a fact that's not going to change so um, and for millennials and Gen Zers, they can really care less, you know, but for, you know, for older Americans, some of them, it is a big deal here over time. I do look at Donald Trump as a symptom, not a cause of, of, of populist right-wing disaffection. So he was the one who simply spoke their language. If you remember from four years ago, 
uh, they were, he ran against 16 other people. And the person who that the establishment Republicans wanted was Jeb Bush. He was their choice. They raised a ton of money for him and his campaign wanted, went nowhere because the base was an open revolt and they wanted this great populist. And Donald Trump spoke their language, the language of grievance and disaffection. And we're going to build a great big beautiful wall to keep all those brown people out of our, out of our country. You know, the xenophobia, the ugliness that came along with this right-wing populism. And, you know, they stand by their man. So it's as ugly as it was. Um, and I wrote in my book here, um, I'm going to quote for myself here real quickly. So it's <laughs> a so quick little one sentence. Um, that uh, Trump drove a red hot poker in America's cultural fissures and fanned the flames, widening an already divided country into hostile camps. So this is in the very, very last chapter of the book, which is called History is Not Over. I posited in the very beginning of the book that um, after the Cold War was over, everyone thought, oh, hey, history is over. So <laughs> my antidote to that was, in fact, that history is not over. So we are still have lots of history to go make and so on. So. That is basically the idea here behind the book. It is uh, 3.31 right now. Um, I, I want to show you a couple of quick little slides and we'll get to the Q&A portion. So actually, I want to share my screen. And so if you have any questions, you can kind of tee, tee those up. So here's a little talk. I just wanted to kind of point out just a couple of things. So the cool thing with Zoom, I can share my screen and show you these things here. Yeah, so here's the cover of my book, which I, I love, especially the, the disrupted words. So the cover designer just did a fantastic job. And then putting the pictures inside the letters, that's just, it's ingenious. I really, really love that. So, <laughs> so you see like under the E, you see W right there, George W. Bush and so on. Um, ba -ba Let me move this forward here. So um, the person who I dedicated the book to, and I, I signed his book just two weeks ago, is to G Bishop Gene Robinson, who was the very first uh, gay Episcopal uh, bishop to be elected in 2003 up in New Hampshire. And a wonderful person. He lives in DuPont, sorry, he lives in Logan Circle now. He lives here locally. So um, I was actually going to spring the big surprise on him. I was going to invite him to politics and prose as sort of my date and then pull him up, him up on stage and let him know that I dedicated the book here to him. But alas, we can't do face-to-face -face events. So I sent him a nice email and he was really blown away by that. And uh, there's the dedication right there from the book. So he is, in fact, one of my favorite disruptors. Uh, so I, I signed that in, in his book here as well. So he's really been really wonderful. That chapter in the book, by the way, the Gay in America chapter, of opens up with the murder of Matthew Shepard. So just have one paragraph on that. But it's a really affecting moment, which I remember deeply in 1998. And then ends 20 years later, 19, sorry, to that, 2018, with the memorial service for Matthew Shepard in National Cathedral, where they finally lay his cremated remains in, in the cathedral. And the person who oversaw that, who, who gave the service, was was Bishop Gene. So it's really wonderful. So hence many reasons why I dedicated the book here to, to Gene Robinson. Just a wonderful person. Um, if you want to do a little test drive of the book, uh, just a week ago Monday up on Literary Hub, which is literaryhub.org, uh, great website. And they've actually published the entire first chapter of the book. And I love the title they give it. <laughs> it kind of cracked me up. Uh, it's called The Decade from Hell. No, not this one, because, <laughs> yeah, we're kind of living through another decade of hell right now. And uh, you, can, you can see my writing style, which is very, very conversational and, and so on. It's kind of like my brother-in-law told me, like, he got an early copy of the book, and he said, like, wow, it's like you're having a conversation with me. And I'm like, yay. So we'll do it with the Zoom applause. So, <laughs> so I really wanted to be not an academic read, but more like a conversation about history that we all shared, because we all went through these experiences here together, just like we're going through the pandemic together. And then um, I wrote an essay that came out a couple weeks ago on the History News Network, which is run by George Washington University. And that essay is called Disruption and Resilience. <laughs> Cheeky subtitle, Lessons from the Ancient History of the 2000s. So which I, I love that subtitle. Um, and it's about 1,800 words or so. Or so. And it's ultimately a positive uh, about our future. Um, out of every crisis, I'm not a prophet or anything like, anything like that, but out of every crisis, and we've had hundreds of crises in our nation's history, but out of every, especially major crisis, there's, all, there's always a catharsis that comes afterwards, a collective will to move forward towards new things. I think the Black Lives Matter protests are part of that catharsis. If anything, it's probably the first catharsis that we're going to have. I don't know what the other ones are going to be, but there will be one. Okay? I promise you. This has always happened. And not that I have a crystal ball, but it's always happened. And therefore, I think it will happen as, as well. So, um, yeah, read the essay if you want to. And I, again, I'm fairly positive 
you know, again, with the pandemic, yeah, it, it, it does suck, okay? But we've gotten through the first quarter. You survived, you know? Um, I liken this like to a baseball game. <laughs> it's, a, it's a, you know, baseball has got nine innings. We made it probably through the first three innings of the game, but the game might go into extra innings, you know? It all depends on how soon we get a vaccine. But until then, this is our new new. This is our new reality. And I think we all kind of accept it by this, by this point. And, you know, we do have to be careful with each other and look after each other, keep wearing our masks and so on. <laughs> so speaking of masks, I've been doing a DC book tour. So if you live in the, in the greater D uh, DC metropolitan area, I'm more than happy to come to you and sign your book. Obviously we can't do book signings at bookstores right now. We can't have mass gatherings because it's not safe to have a lot of people all getting together. However, if you, if you uh, call me up, send me an email, whatever, and I will come to you and I will sign your book. You will meet in public, we'll meet outside. I bring the hand sanitizer, you will wear your mask. No mask, you do not get your book signed, okay? That's the condition. And I've signed already a couple dozen books, so including a couple here this morning. And um, I was out in Gaithersburg, Maryland yesterday. A couple, a couple of friends offered me their driveway and actually their carport because it was raining. And <laughs> so people drove their cars up and they came out of their cars and you know, we signed the books and it, it's really wonderful. So um, the way to contact me, if you look on the bottom of my screen, right, right down there. So there's my website and uh, garrettpeck.com, two R's and two T's slash contact. There's a little form you can fill out. All those emails go right to me and uh, yeah, we'll set up some time here. I think it's pretty safe to meet outdoors if you have any, you know, squeamishness or whatever about, you know, the, the, I'm with you on the fear of the virus. I take it very, very seriously. And I take every precaution here uh, to keep you safe, which is where I wear, or why I wear my mask. And this is why you're going to wear your mask as well. So um, yeah, again, reach out. I'm happy to come to you and happy to sign your book. And I got my pen ready right here for you. So <laughs> All right. Um, and again, thank you so much for coming here today and for your support of Politics and Prose Bookstore. So, Beth Wang, right. are you ready to do some Q&A? I am. Are you? I am ready. Love thank it. Um, let me pull them up. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, can I get my screen? Okay, here we go. Uh, so, Mark has actually asked a bunch of great questions, or cool. a couple of great questions, and I'll, I'll ask them both. Um, Mark would like to know, uh, do you have a next book in mind or underway? And then um, kind of as a follow-up question, um, if you were to write a book about this century's second decade, oh. um, which just <laughs> ended, um, what would its title be um, oh. and why? Yeah, oh man, second one. <laughs> a decade from hell certainly fits, you know, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't have any plans at this moment to write a, a sequel, but, uh, you know, never say never, right? So if there's a great outpro uh, public outpouring, then maybe I will. But um, the book actually I'm working on is about Willa Cather and how she wrote the book, Death Comes to the Archbishop. And uh, so I want to get that one out in a couple of years. Uh, it's one of the great books of the 20th century, it came out in 1927, and she, and she herself considered it her best book. And just in, in uh, two, 2013, sorry, 2011, her letters were finally released to the, to the public. So in other words, we can actually quote from her letters. And this, will, this opens up a whole new realm of scholarship around it, uh, around how, what she was feeling at the time during all her different travels to, to New Mexico. And it's, it's a wonderful novel and all written based on actual places that she visited in New Mexico. So look for that in a few years and hopefully a future PNP talk around that topic. You know, not as well, hopefully like a Willa Cather tour of New Mexico around this idea. Oh, that's fabulous. Okay, yeah. great. Um, so thank you so much. And uh, that uh, second decade title, uh, a decade <laughs> yeah. from hell, fitting, fitting, I think. Yeah. Um, so uh, this next one is from John, uh, who asks, how have tribal oppositions like ours been resolved in the past? So kind of what, yeah, what you're talking about, about yeah. tribalism. Um, well, obviously, the, the worst tribal moment, you think it's bad right now. Of course, that's nothing compared to the 1850s. Like, oh, my gosh. I mean, we, went to, we eventually went to war with each other in the Civil War over the question because we could not resolve our differences over the question of slavery. Um, but most of our history, we have had tribalism. And it's one of the big things. Uh, the founding fathers, when they wrote the Constitution, didn't quite factor in. They, they intended Congress to be the strong branch, but they didn't quite factor in factionalism that this was gonna arise. And of course, very famously, George Washington wrote in his farewell address, uh, yeah, warning Americans about getting, not getting involved in foreign entanglements. That was actually not the main point of his address. 
his, his main point was warning people against political parties. So he was already seeing the urbanites, the federalists versus uh, the, the yeoman farmers, that is the Thomas Jefferson group, <laughs> um, them already being at loggerheads against each other and having distinctly different ideologies, even by 1800. So really remarkable. Um, one of the things that can definitely help out, you've seen this with great leadership, that has really been a huge factor. We're, certainly we're not seeing this with the current president and that's not a, a partisan statement anyway, by the way, um, whatever you feel about Trump, um, he has really stoked the fires and really sides with his base. That's really who he's governing for, uh, but not the rest of the country. Uh, when you have a great leader who can speak towards everyone, and I, I look you know, really towards like Franklin Roosevelt, who had an, an astonishing gift for empathy. And you know, so many people commented about Franklin Roosevelt, and he, came, he was a man of privilege. I mean, he really was. He was a one percenter. But in 1921, he gets stric stricken by polio. And I think that really dramatically changes his, his, his worldview. And so he runs as someone who's running for the common man, even though he's, he's rich. <laughs> but he has the language of, of empathy towards the working man. And you see this right away at the fireside chats and, and whatnot. He has the ability to calm people down and to bring people together. And it's a remarkable gift. So he was a great statesman and a great politician and one of the few, few presidents who really combined both. I think the other great person was Abraham Lincoln who had the great statesmanship and political skills together in one person. So leadership is a huge, huge factor. I mean, having someone who can speak to all Americans and remind us all what we have in common, not just speaking to what our individual identity groups have. You know, It is something I'm critical toward the left as well, because the, the Democratic Party is, is, is a collection of minority groups, essentially, um, from African Americans to LGBT, to I should, you know, the queer community, and, and so on. And it's really easy for the different groups to circle their wagons and, uh, you know, decry cultural appropriation and how dare you stay in your lane and so on. It's, I think, one of the things I do, do criticize the left, the, the left wing alliance uh, over this. So having leadership that can speak empathetic towards all people and reminding us what we all have in common in this democratic society is really, really important. And it's one of the things I'm looking for towards this election. You know, who can bring us all together as a people? Empathy. It's an important skill as a leader. Absolutely. Um, Jonathan would, li um, would like to know, between 9-11, Katrina, and the pandemic, how do you think our country has evolved or not in responding to national crises? Do you see a pattern there? Um, mm, yeah. Um, certainly 9-11 brought everyone together, at least for a brief moment. And it was a remarkable moment. I mean, remember the, the real nifty uh, slogan got, got pulled out, the uh, uh, United We Stand, that was from World War II. And you know, people really felt together because we had all been attacked on 9-11. And uh, it was kind of a brief moment in American history, um, certainly shattered by the, the debate over the Iraq war. And then the huge fallout when we couldn't find the weapons of mass destruction and everything, and you know, the huge black eye that put on the, on the intelligence community. So that seems to be kind of our nature as a, as a nation. Um, national unity is very hard to ever achieve in our country. Um, Barack Obama certainly tried during the Great Recession to bring the country together. But I think there was part of the country, in part because he was a black man that did not want to be reconciled. So despite his great language, and Obama really, you look back on it, he really was a moderate. He, he, people call him a socialist, et cetera. All those are just slogans. He really was a moderate president. And he did try to meet people you know, halfway, but the Tea Party did not want to negotiate with him. And then, of course, you get to the pandemic, his current moment where I, I do see actually a great deal of solidarity that, that has arisen out of this. That's largely because we've all collectively decided that we are going to have solidarity. You know, we all recognize, most of us anyways, the importance of wearing our masks. You know, I go by my local giant and you see occasionally the one person who isn't and it's like, dude, did you not get the memo? You know, you're, you might potentially be infecting the poor workers who work here today. Where's your damn mask? And not that I scold anyone. Scolding doesn't work. But, um, I think collectively we've, we've built a great deal of solidarity out of this. You see this as well with the public sympathy towards the Black, My Black Lives Matter protests and so on. So this is really despite the leadership from the top, which is really trying to be, trying to downplay both. I mean, the president is trying to run on the, would like to run on the, on the economy, but you know, we are gonna be in a deep recession until we get a vaccine folks. So hold on to your, on to your, on your hats because this is the way things are gonna be going forward, I think well into 2021. We are not, this recession is gonna be long lasting. 
and the repercussions from it are going to last years afterwards, just like they did for the Great Recession. So thank you for that question, Jonathan. Um, we've got one from Robert, and then maybe we'll do one after this. Um, but Robert's question is, other than, than um, the presidents and other heads of state, who do you think were the people of the decade? Um, the ones that we will still be talking about when you write your book about the 2040s. <laughs> yeah. a presumption in that, but um, I, I think it's a great question. Who do you think are going to be those people of, of the um, first decade of the millennium? Yeah, I mean, obviously George W. Bush is, is a key person. Um, his presidency is eight years of that first decade. Um, so he, he's a crucial factor uh, throughout it all. Um, and I did, I mean, a decade has passed, more than a decade since W. Uh, left office. And in the chapter dealing with the, the uh, 2008 election, actually I wrote a, a, an assessment of the Bush presidency. And because enough time has passed, sort of like you, you take your partisan hat off and just assess, okay, where, where did you go right? Where did you go wrong? And I weighed it all out. Every president is nuanced. Every presidency has its successes and its failures. Obviously, the Iraq war was a huge, huge failure, but W did some other things that were very, very important. And so I do give him some credit. And one thing I'll definitely put in his, in his plus column, I didn't learn about this until recently, but he created the nation's pandemic plan. Yeah, 2005, after the anthrax scare. So he, he created this, this you know, plan that you put in the safe, you break the glass in case a pandemic breaks out. That's exactly what the Obama administration did in early 2009 when the, uh, the swine flu hit, the H1N1 swine flu hit, and they executed on the plan nearly flawlessly. This is why it was a pandemic, but it never reached the proportions of where we are today. And of course, our current crisis that we're in were because we had ample warning, 70 days that we did nothing, even though we had a pandemic plan waiting right there in the safe. And, you know, the cat got out of the bag and now we're dealing with this until we get a vaccine. So, so W, you, you obviously cannot ignore. Uh, I, I, I think very, very importantly, uh, Barack Obama, we still have to really assess the impact of his presidency because it's still, we're still in the immediacy of, of, of his time. He left the Oval Office just a little more than three years ago, but obviously he'll be a really crucial character of, of, of there as, as we look back from 2040 and on. So I hope we're all still here in the 2040s. <laughs> so thank you for that, Robert. <laughs> Um, and then I'll come back on to ask my final question for you. Um, during this time, we're all kind of uh, drawn to introspection and, um, you know, reading as much as we can. And I'm wondering what you're reading right now. Oh, boy. <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a stack here on, on my desk. So <laughs> um, I'll show you some of the things here. Um, well, I'm, I, I write fiction. Sorry, I write nonfiction, which is always very uh, research intense. So um, obviously I'm going through a whole bunch of Willa Cather literature right now. So, but um, I'm teaching a class coming up starting a week from tomorrow. So one of my summertime reads has been this book. So it's hard to read with the glare, but it's The Education of Henry Adams. Yeah, uh, written here in Washington, DC. And it came out in, uh, in 1918. So I'm teaching a class about this book. It's a, it's a tome, as you, as you can tell here right there. So um, and I'm reading a lot of literature to go along with it so I can help educate my class. So right now I'm reading Five of Hearts. It's about uh, Henry Adams and his friends, including his, his wife, Clover, who that statue, if you've ever been to Rock Creek Cemetery, uh, there's this beautiful, oh, it's just heartbreaking, the statue. It's a funerary statue, one of the most significant funerary statues in the country, uh, sculpted by, or cast by Augustus St. Gaudens, uh, St. Gaudens. And um, that's called the Adams Memorial, but officially it's called Grief. So she committed suicide in 1885. Um, so I've been reading through that. Um, going along with my Willa Cather research, I picked up this book. This is an original copy <laughs> of Witter Binner. Um, he was sort of the queen of the Santa Fe artist community. And he got in this little uh, dispute with Mabel Dodge Luhan, who herself was the queen of the art community of Taos. And uh, she lured away uh, his lover and secretary to become her secretary. So he wrote a play skewering her and it's hysterically funny. It came out in 1926. And so I've been reading through it and it's, it's a riot. <laughs> so not that Mabel didn't deserve it. She kind of did, but she thought she was going to say Western civilization. So <laughs> really, That's awesome. so I've been kind of thinking in terms of, 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 to go along with my book, like writing a play that might incorporate kind of a play within the play of, you know, six characters, including D.H. Lawrence and his wife, Frida, and then uh, Mabel Dodge Luhan and her, and her husband, uh, Tony Luhan, who was from Taos Pueblo. And then Winter Oh, this is so cool, by the way. I found this in a used shop, used bookstore. 
in Santa Fe and he had signed the book. Look at his handwriting. People don't write this way. So this is oh, 1942. Look at that. His nickname was Hal. So, because Witter Bitter, I mean, it rhymes. So, he was a great poet. But I mean, God, I wish I could write that. What do you see when I write in your book? You're not going to be able to read it. It's so. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, um, I, I, there, actually, there was a question in the chat from um, Allison Witten, who works at Politics and Pro. Allison! Um, yeah. She's wondering, <laughs> um, her question was Will there be a decade of disruption tour in DC? Um, and I'm assuming that um, if you go to garrettpeck.com slash contact um, and set up a time to to do your uh, pandemic book tour, you'll be able to come to DC. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> yeah, I don't know if there's gonna be any actual tours, although, you know, certainly part of our disruption right now is doing, you know, the, the protests and so on that are going on. But, uh, you know, major tourist events, that kind of stuff, I, I think major tourism is probably off until we can get a vaccine. It's just, you know, we all saw that when the tourism industry imploded in back in March, so yeah. Um, my last book, by the way, I'm, I'm I, this is one of these books that's been, I, I picked it up a few months ago and I, it's sitting right at the very top of my reading list um, at the center of all beauty by Fenton Johnson. And I, um, every day I look at it like, I need to go read that book. We all have a stack of books, right? And <laughs> so, and it's, it's about solitude and the creative life. And, you know, I, I'm a confirmed bachelor, wink, you know, so, <laughs> so it's a book, you know, about, about okay being being single and so on but they, being able to have a creative life and, and so on so um that's lovely so that's been my book i really really want to get to it but i gotta first Don't finish worry. up my prep for the for the uh the henry games class, Sorry, henry Adams class. and that's a politics and prose class that people can find um by going on to our website you can still sign up i believe yeah absolutely um and obviously it's going to be over zoom just like this and we'll um zoom is super easy to use we um uh, Cool little tool we've all learned, which is using the space bar. So when you're on mute, so it's like a little CB quality thing. You just press the space bar and it takes you off of mute. And then it puts you right back on mute as soon as you release. So um, the class is a week from tomorrow. That's when it starts. It's, it's a two-term class. So it's the 29th and July 6th. And so we'll read what, is the, what the modern library called the number one book of the 20th century in the English language. So it's a very important book and it's, it's, a, it's a great book. I love it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and everybody listening should check out um, Garrett's class on PMP's website yeah. um, while you're already there buying the book. It's like one stop shopping. Absolutely. Final little pitch point here for, for everyone. If, if you're considering buying the book, please do consider buying it from Politics and Prose. It's, it's really important at this time. We are obviously in a very deep recession. We all want to help out our local retailers. So whether you buy my book, of uh, Fenton Johnson's book, you know, any other book, please, please, please support. I'm giving you the, the Zoom applause. <laughs> please support our local bookstores. It's absolutely vital that we give a financial lifeline to our local retailers, because otherwise we could very well be faced with a retail apocalypse, because this recession is going to go on for a long time, really until we get a vaccine. So all of our local retailers are, are going to be under pressure here on how they're going to stay in business. We, we got to help them out, and that's by buying products from them. And that you buy from curbside and pick up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Garrett, thank you so much for that. For that very Thank you, Beth. Talk. And I uh, look forward to hearing everyone. Feel, feel free to write me. Um, I'm happy to chat further with everyone. And I'm happy to come to you and to sign your books. Here's my pen. Waiting to come visit to you. So. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us um, this afternoon. I'll um, direct you to, to the chat again. Um, the link for Garrett's book is there, um, and it'll take you to Politics and Prose website. Um, Garrett is correct. We do really need those online purchases to, to keep our doors open. Um, but we so appreciate you for, for spending time with us here this weekend. Um, so to everybody, stay well, stay well read, and we will see you next time. And happy Father's Day, everyone. Yeah, happy Father's Day. Yeah. Bye, Garrett. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thanks again. Take care. You too.